So, the big tease continues. Nikon has released the first of what appears to be a series of four teaser videos, giving us glimpses of the much-anticipated flagship mirrorless camera, the Z9. I haven't had much to say about it since the development announcement back in March. That's not to say I haven't been thinking about it and following the rumors, and there's been lots of them. And during the summer, I saw the leaked photos from the Olympics that showed the back of the Z9 with the gaffer taped screen. Now we know why. Catch that last moment of the teaser? Now, with the signs of this imminent release, I'm asking myself, will I actually pre-order one? Hi, Ray here. I'm glad you could join me. If this is your first time here, please consider subscribing if this kind of content is your thing. And do give this video the old thumbs up. It really helps move things along. So with these teasers, is it Nikon's strategy to keep us interested while stalling for time? Have they been holding back to see what the competition brings to the table so they can raise the stakes? This video sort of parallels the approach. <laughs> I've been waiting to see how my colleagues cover this latest chapter in the gestation of the Z9. People like uh, Ricci and uh, Matt Irwin, who both pay more attention than I do to the developments in the industry. And Matt, I owe you a debt of gratitude for your recent shout out. Thank you very much. I'm guessing a few of you are here today on Matt's recommendation, and I, I hope I can live up to it. We now have, via the first teaser, a clear look at the rear layout of the camera. And there aren't too many surprises to joysticks and other controls to facilitate use with the built-in vertical grip. Keeping in mind this looks like it's fitted with the big 50mm 1.2 lens, it's not a small camera. So there goes one of the attractions of mirrorless. I'll be interested to discover its weight. My thoughts are focused, so to speak, on the practicalities of my actually purchasing one. Let's get the rumored specs out of the way first, and acknowledgement is due to Nikon rumors where I cribbed most of these. And no doubt many of you will already be familiar with them. So here they are. Now. As I say, I want to sort of meditate on what features and attractions might tempt me to invest the substantial amount Nikon will likely demand for this groundbreaking flagship camera. More on that later. I was out on the weekend shooting some B-roll with the Nikon Z6, and I'll fit some in at the end of this video, and I said to my wife, just think how cool it would be to be able to grab a frame from this stuff and actually have something printable. Since 8K video from the Z9 would be what? Um, 7, 6, 80 by 43, 20 pixels? Yes, dear, Amanda replied, <laughs> gazing off over the pumpkins. Anyway, on to other anticipated Z9 specs that interest me. That high burst rate, rumored at 30 frames per second, it would be nice, because besides buildings and people, I like to shoot birds and bikes. Apparently there'll be car tracking, but why not bikes? <laughs> There's an idea for your first firmware update, Nikon. Or, you can fit it in before a release, but only if it doesn't delay the release. I know, eye face detect would likely work in most cases, and it looks like there's something different happening in the Z9's eye detect. I'm not sure, but dual eye detect? But bike detect would, uh, it would please a cycling freak like me. I want 8K video because, as I mentioned in my initial take, it's not so much about the actual resolution for those who reflexively ask, who has an 8K monitor? No, it's about the ability to choose areas of an 8K image to crop, zoom, and pan and then render in 4K, and as noted, those big frame grabs. No one to my knowledge 
um, has talked about IBIS. Canon competition has set the bar at eight stops of five axis stabilization. Did I mention dynamic range? <laughs> I loves me lots of that. And I'm confident we're going to see improvements in that department. Now the big question, how much will it cost? Some say 6,000 US, 7,000. So 7,600 to 8,800 Canadian. Me, I hope Nikon can compete with Canon's EOS R5 price of $5,400 US. But have you considered expenses above and beyond the Z9 camera body itself? It's always those extras, really, that mount up. How much, for instance, do I have invested in my Z6s and accessories? The Z6 I outfitted for video, the full rig, tops over five grand. When it comes to batteries, the ENEL15, the Z6 and 7 use, were handy. I had a half a dozen from my DSLRs, but the new batteries, they're going to be much more expensive. Uh, for me, around $270 compared to $100 Canadian for the ENEL15. CF Express, you'll need some <laughs> big mother cards, especially if 8K video is part of your use case. Remember the people who whinged about the cost of XQD? I'm guessing this camera won't be for them. And if video is part of your use case, it might make sense to buy a Ninja 5 Plus at $1,500 US, 2000 Canadian, that can record 8K externally, avoiding any problems associated with 8K recording, like overheating. And you extend record times exponentially. The Ninja 5 Plus debuted celebrating collaboration with Canon and the EOS R5 to bring 8K 30p ProRes RAW via HDMI. Think back to the launch of the Z6 and Nikon's lead on ProRes RAW via HDMI. So I'm guessing, hoping, that the next announcement will be the addition of the Z9 to the compatible camera list of the Ninja 5 Plus. And media would come in much cheaper. For my first generation Ninja 5, I've been using WD Blue SSDs. Uh, for one terabyte, they cost $120 Canadian. And then the compatible Master Caddy 2 is, they're $80 for five, so $16. So $136 or $108 US for that capacity. They boast sequential read speeds up to 560 megabytes a second and sequential write speeds up to 530. That's the same as the equivalent Atom X SSD Mini, one terabyte from Angelbird, that cost 550 Canadian. And the other thing to think about, and I am, are requirements for processing and storage of those big 8256 by, what is it, 5504 pixel files? Not to mention the 8K video. I've been holding off on buying a new workstation computer. Apple's silicon offerings, as impressive as the first iterations have been, don't, I think, measure up as professional video editing machines. Not for 8K, I don't think. Even when it comes to processing their own Apple ProRes codec. Right now, for instance, I'm using a 2020 Intel MacBook. And I spared no expense as far as computing power. I maxed everything out. And proxy media use is still a must on anything but the simplest 4K timeline. So um, I'd be interested to hear your experience, especially if you have an M1 Mac processing 4K, or better yet, 8K video. What's your experience? I'm not alone in awaiting the M1X chip to see what it'll offer along with expanded memory options above 16 gigabytes. One thing is for certain, a loaded machine is not going to be cheap. The first generation Mini with Apple M1 chip, 8-core uh, CPU, 8-core GPU, and 16-core neural engine, with 16 gigabytes of unified memory and, let's say, 2 terabytes of storage, because that's what I generally like, it runs 1,700 US. That's 2,150 Canadian. But the Mini makes sense for me, and it'll work out cheaper than, say, a new iMac. Mine is now nine years old, since I already have a monitor, keyboard, and mouse that I use with the MacBook at my workstation. Still, I'd have to budget about another 3,000 Canadian or more, I'm thinking. 
Rumors surrounding the M1X Max are exciting the same kind of speculation here on YouTube as the Nikon Z9 that they will be announced this month at an October event, of course. So, am I going to take the leap to the Nikon Z9? <laughs> well, I've said before that I've, I've never owned a Nikon flagship camera. Back in the 80s, I worked uh, with the prosumer FM cameras rather than the Fs. I chose the F90X, still have one of each of those, and various triple Ds over their single digit digital pro version. If Nikon released a Z8 alongside the Z9, I'd, I'd go for one. But that's not going to happen, is it? Nikon knows, I think, that that would eat into Z9 sales. For stills, I do feel the Z6 restrictive in some areas, well, in terms of megapixels, but I held off on the Z7 and Z7 II. And again, there's that 8K video. If it can record 8K ProRes RAW internally without compromises, wow, that'll be awesome. I've not updated my Z6s to shoot ProRes RAW because for my use, the 10-bit with the Ninja has been satisfactory to date. Remember, the Canon R5's advertised recording times are for 8K 30p, full sensor, raw, 20 minutes, 4K 120p, full sensor, 15 minutes, 4K 60p, full sensor width, 35 minutes, and so on. So Nikon has a chance to up the game here. You'd want to budget another $1,000 minimum for a fast high capacity CF Express type B card. That's just one. Again, when it comes to video, it might be wiser to invest in the Ninja 5 Plus in addition. What about other accessories? If you're gonna press it into service for video, you might want a cage, and I hope someone like Smallwig jump in with a half cage that can be quickly removed. I think that would be best for the Z9. Well, I definitely have the anticipatory Fever. Nikon have teased us with promises of a revolutionary camera and now these glimpses <laughs> of the flagship itself. We know there'll be more of these video clips designed to tickle our camera fancy. How far apart, I think? A week? A month? Surely not four months until actual release. So perhaps a November general release. Obviously, all manufacturers are laboring under the same parts supply and shipping problems. So I think the wait might be lengthy. This is a guess, but it wouldn't surprise me if we, other than the, <laughs> the chosen ones, can't actually lay hands on a production model before 2022. Well, that gives me time to consider all these options. You can see, especially if you're a regular visitor, I've reverted to the popular fireside chat series because Given that we're well into autumn here in the Great White North, we're actually heating the house on chilly mornings and evenings. It's the season of pumpkins and, we hope, treats rather than tricks. It's the season of superb light when you can actually venture out at midday without being <laughs> either a mad dog or an Englishman. Tis the season of wild winds and scudding clouds and monsoon-like rains too. Here on the west coast of North America, it's the month of returning salmon and Thanksgiving feast. It's my favorite time of the year. Well, these are mostly reiterations of my earlier Z9 thoughts, but with a more specific analysis of my use case. What would be your use case? Video? Stills? Both? Let me know in the comments below. I hope my considerations proved interesting for you. So until the next time, take care of yourself. Cheers. We'll see you in the next one.